For those who may not have been in the beginning of this series of studies, I have attempted to do this and am attempting to do it so that each lesson will stand on its own, but at the same time be a lesson on the fundamentals and first principles of rightly dividing the word of truth, which we must if we study correctly, 2 Timothy 2.15. And of offering those things to people who want to be grounded in the faith of Jesus Christ, which covers not only those who need to become Christians, but also those who are members of the Lord's church. In previous sermons, a partial view of the work of the ambassadors of Christ, the apostles of Christ, for about 20 years in presenting the word of reconciliation, for that's been the general theme under which we've been studying, their presentation of this to the world has been taken in these sermons. It's been found that man was alienated from God, that this particular alienation resulted from man's sins, his transgression of God's law, his wrongdoing, 1 John 3, 4, and Romans 3, 23. And that the purpose of the ministry of reconciliation was to break down this alienation and bring them together in a state of friendship and amity with God. It is important to understand that when two things are separated, a force must be exerted upon one or both in order to bring them together. This is true alike of material substances as well as moral conditions. Material substances separated can only be brought together by physical force. Where the separation is in moral conditions, it is then moral force alone that can be used to bring them together. The separation that exists between God and man is, of course, a moral nature. Therefore, the exercise of moral force must be exerted to bring them together. There must be persuasion. Either God must be persuaded to come to the sinner or the sinner must be persuaded to come to God. Thus, the inspired apostle Paul asked this question. Do I now persuade men or God? Now, the answer to this question will determine the rightfulness or the wrongfulness of different methods existent in religions that claim to be religions of God. One method is to labor with man to bring him to God. The other method is to work with God to bring him to the sinner. And in years past, if you study denominationalism and the various theologies, for lack of a better way to put it, that they embrace, most of them, if not all of them, contrary to the teaching of the Bible and the New Testament in particular, you will find that many times they will talk about God being reconciled to the sinner. And that usually finds itself presented in what was one time well known among the people who espouse it, but not so much today, and that is the old Calvinistic system. It says that all men are born of this world having inherited Adam's original sin. But now some of those men before the world was was foreordained and predestined to be saved, whether they liked it or not or wanted to or not. And others the same concerning salvation. But they're all born having inherited Adam's original sin and thus have to find out whether they're one of the predestined to be saved or predestined to be lost. And thus they had what was called the old mourner's bench system. There would be a call for those in the audience who wanted to be saved to come to that bench, as it were, usually at the front of the building or to the side. 
And they would go through an episodes of mourning their sins to let God know how much they wanted to be saved. Now, mind you, that wouldn't necessarily guarantee somebody to be saved because remember, some people before the foundation of the world in eternity past, God foreordained to be lost. Period. And that's it. Others before a name of God before the foundation of the world to be saved. Now nobody knows who is who. Well you say what about the preaching of the word? Well you see in that state of original sin which all people are in that false doctrine then uh, you're inclined to no good thing at all so you can't attend to the good word. You've got to have some direct work of the Holy Spirit on you to let you know that you're one of those God before the foundation of the world for ordained to be saved. And so you're mourning your sins, waiting for some direct indication from God, independent, separate and apart from the teaching of the scriptures, to let you know that you're one of those foreordained and predestined to be saved. So these people would come to the old mourner's bench system. And there would be different ones in the audience sometimes asked to pray for them and to cry out to God for them and the preacher would do the same or maybe more than one preacher with his fervent oratory and his deathbed scenes and the passions of the people were all aroused so that uh, so many of them even fall on the floor and prostrate themselves before what was called the, the altar call. There would be the heart-rending cries and pleadings of the mourners. There would be the impassioned songs and prayers and shouts and all kind of exhortations of the workers. And um, if you've ever attended anything like that or at least read graphic descriptions of them, then they, they were scenes um, that begged description. <laughs> Lord, come and save these poor mourners. Lord, Thou hast promised to save those who are tired of sin. Thou knowest that these mourners want to be saved. Now make Thyself a great name in the salvation of many souls tonight. And on and on and go, this kind of thing went. I remember one time the late G.K. Wallace as a boy went with a cousin of his to one of those meetings. And when all of this was going on, he was versed in the scriptures. Obviously, these people were believers. Obviously, these people were repentant who were at the mourner's bench. Obviously, they were confessing Christ by their actions that they wanted to be saved. Thus, as believers, repentant, confessing. And the preacher was saying, come up and give words of exhortation. Brother Wallace went up to the bench and said, now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. He was ejected from the assembly and arrested and brought before the court for disturbing the religious assembly. When the judge said what was wrong, and the man said he quoted scripture, the judge got a perplexed look on his face. He said, how is it that in a religious assembly purporting to teach the scriptures, that a man quoting scripture disturbed the assembly? And he threw the thing out of court. It's a strange thing that men will hold to a false religion to the point of being blinded to the simplicity of the meaning of words in the Bible that were offered at the exact right time when people were obviously mourning their sins, evidencing repentance, who were there by implication confessing their faith in Christ. Obviously they believed. And then when told the next step, they were so wedded to their false doctrine that they could not see the truth preached. Brethren, that ought to scare every one of us no matter how long you've been a member of the church or whether you're a member or not. Because it tells us how we can become so entrenched, so dedicated, so wedded to something that we love that when the truth hits us, we'll reject the truth and hang on to what we love. The scriptures clearly teach clearly teach that in every age of the world there's always been an attitude of God's love and compassion toward man. When man would turn from his sins, his transgression of God's law, he always found God ready to forgive. And he's that way right this day. And will be the end of time. To the Jews... 
Jesus said, or God said, actually the Old Testament. Listen to him in Isaiah 55, 7. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. And do our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Isaiah 55, 7. We read in Ezekiel 18 and verse 23. The prophet speaking in the place of God to a sinful people. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, saith the Lord? And not that he should return from his ways and live? Then in verse 12 of the same chapter. For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God. Wherefore turn yourselves and live ye. In the same book in the 33rd chapter in verse 11. As I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. For why will you die, O house of Israel? The same line of thought continues to run throughout the New Testament of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Notice with me a few passages from the divine volume. Come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Then in the last book of the Bible. The book of Revelation. The spirit and the bride say come. And let him that heareth say come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will. Let him take the water of life freely. Revelation twenty two seventeen. And then we have used this one many times to show that time is continuing because God loves us and wants us to change our ways. Where Peter penned in 2 Peter 3, 9 concerning the waiting of the Lord till He comes again. The Lord is not slack concerning His promises. Some men count slackness. But is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I suggest to you sometimes when you see such Terrible actions by ungodly people in this world to remember Christ died for them. And to remember 2 Peter 3, 9, that he's not willing that any of them should perish. This doesn't remove the fact that men who do wrong and violate law should not suffer for their sins. But it does mean ultimately and finally that God wants them in heaven with him and has made provision for them to get there. And he stands ready for them to be saved when they make up their mind from the heart so to do. Man must be reconciled to God and not God to man. All you have to do to understand that is know that who left whom? God never left us. God never went against any promise He ever made to us. And I speak of us as mankind in general. We are the ones who left Him. We would do well to remember that back there in the garden it wasn't God leaving us, it was us leaving Him. And so it's always been. Following the flood, man was all on God's side again. But it was man who by his transgressions left God once again. Now listen. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So Paul penned to the church at Rome in Romans 5 and verse 10. And now the passage, and this is the reason I didn't begin with it this morning, because I knew I was going to use it here, concerning the words of reconciliation. As Paul said to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 20, And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. And thus the we there, meaning the apostles and not the church in general, for it's through them that God by the Holy Spirit gave us the New Testament of Jesus Christ. It is how the gospel got into this world as far as the revelation. That's the New Testament. 
the word of reconciliation. In Ephesians 2 and verse 16, continuing in the same line of thought, Paul said to the church in Ephesus, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity, that is the hate thereby, meaning the hate between Jew and Gentile. And how that the law once separated the Jews from the Gentiles, but through Christ and his gospel, the word of reconciliation. Not only are men reconciled to God as they humbly believe and from the heart obey it and are baptized into Christ, but they're reconciled to one another. People talk about a UN and a NATO and all of this stuff like that to reconcile men to one another. There's only one thing going to properly and fully as God intends to reconcile men to one another. And that's their common belief and practice of the truth of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. It's the only thing that will work. God is not hard. God is not implacable. And there are those who would like to paint him as that way. God wants everybody to be saved. God is just the opposite. He's loving, he's tender, and he's compassionate. You say, well, why did God make things as he did? It would be terrible if he had made man as a robot. You have no choice in the matter. You're going to do what God tells you. Now, right now, your mind's saying, but what if I didn't want to? But you see, if you didn't have free will, that would never be there. You would just do it without any thought, without any concern, without any choice, without putting this aside so you can do God's will, there would be no way for you to demonstrate your love of God above all things and your trust and faith in God if you didn't have the will to choose. And when God made us with the will to choose, then he made it possible for us to reject him, to violate. And thus this world is perfect for what God made it to be, a place of showing God we love him. Or we don't. We have faith in him according to his word, or we do not, Romans 10, 17. We're going to stay with him through thick and thin, or we won't. There will be something more important to us of this present world. So it's a schoolroom where God's our teacher. The Bible's a textbook. The devil supplies a test because God lets him. And we have a body that says, well, this year would feel good or taste good or whatever. But God says no. Or God says yes. And I must submit my will to his will, for that's the only way a free moral agent can show his love of God or faith in God and godly things. God wants people, you see, in the eternity to come who never were there, never in the presence of God to experience God, living in a complete different realm, only with the adequate evidence that would persuade him that God is. Notice persuade him. Because man has a free will. He's a rational creature. To persuade him of his existence, that Jesus is deity, the Bible is the word of God, and appeal to him through the truth. And we can make our choice here in this world, a place of choices, to show God whether we love him or we don't. And many won't. But some will. And what God has in store for those who are faithful unto death is beyond the mortal mind to gather. But there's something great He's got in store for all that love and keep His commandments and triumph over sin, though having never been in the presence of God here on this earth as God. Even in the presence of Christ in the flesh, they were not in the presence of God in the sense that He is presently in heaven and before the Incarnation. Jesus emphasized greatly that what would God do if he were a man? And all he had to say is, have you been so long with me that you don't know? I am God in the flesh. This is what God does as a man. And thus he appeals to us on our own level and ability to understand, offering all manner of adequate evidence to show us that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God and that He is the way, the truth, and the life and that no man comes to the Father but by Him. John 14, verse 6. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And we're familiar with that John three sixteen passage. 
Then John also wrote to Christians in 1 John 4, 9, In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. But He won't force it upon us, because He wants people in heaven with Him who chose to be there, though they'd never been there, who by the rational intellectual powers God gave Him said, This is the better way. This is is the only way. And we choose that and will not be turned from it because the way of the cross leads home. We love Him, John said in verse 19 of 1 John 4, because He first loved us. Paul said it this way to the church at Rome, Or despisest thou the riches of His goodness and forbearance and long suffering? not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Everything consistent with man's volitional nature that infinite wisdom and infinite love could do to save man has been done. And that we proclaim through the word of reconciliation. No wonder then the great apostle said, not long before his departure from this world, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. But then he tells us something about men, even those who had believed on him. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap unto themselves teachers, having itching ears, and shall be turned away from the truth unto fable. So it has always been in the record of mankind. Because truly, many are called but few are chosen. From what has been revealed of God's willingness to save, it is simply inconceivable that the combined entreaties of all the righteous people, as the Bible defines righteousness, on this earth could make him more willing to save than he has shown himself. The apostles of the Christ with their peculiar work as the ambassadors of the court of heaven, always labored with man and persuaded man with the word of reconciliation, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, Paul wrote to the Corinthians, we persuade men. 2 Corinthians 5.11 On the day of Pentecost, Acts 2, after instructing, teaching the multitude, in Peter's sermon we find the exhortation to them, saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. American Standard, 1901, crooked generation, Acts 2.40. Later in that second recorded sermon, on, in the temple at Solomon's porch, Peter said to the people, repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. And by the way, if you take Acts 2.38 as answer to believers on the day of Pentecost, and compare it to what he says here to those people then. You can see that converted, that your sins may be blotted out, is parallel to be baptized for the remission of sins. The love of God led him to send, as we've studied, an angelic messenger to tell Cornelius to send for a certain man, Simon Peter in this case, who would tell him, what he ought to do. That's a moral imperative. What he ought to do, Acts 10, 6. What he ought to do if he wants to be reconciled to God. What he ought to do if he wants his sins remitted. Paul in his address to the elders of the church at Ephesus said, Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Acts 20, verses 26 and 27. Then notice what we have in verse 31 as he continued and closed out his address to the Ephesian elders. Therefore, that means in the light of what I've done and how I live before you and what I taught. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Then to the church at Colossae he wrote, whom we preach, 
warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Colossians 1.28 Perfect meaning spiritually complete. And notice you're spiritually complete in Christ Jesus. Paul would say in Ephesians 1 and verse 3 that all spiritual blessings in heavenly places are in Christ. He also said in Galatians 3 and verse 27 that we are baptized into Christ. Now that ought to tell us something. The language is not hard to understand. And if we would set aside all things contrary thereto, no matter how long we believed it, then we would understand at what step one takes to get into Christ where God has located all spiritual blessings. And in that condition, Paul says, I want to present you to the Lord. You're complete in Christ. Outside of Christ, you're not. But you're only in Christ when in faith, repentance, confession of faith in Christ, and taking the step that puts you into Christ, and immersed in water by the authority of Christ, into Christ are you beneficiaries of the blessings that are located only in Christ. Sonship, forgiveness of sins, and the hope of heaven being one of them, or three of them. When in prison at Rome to those who came to his lodging, Luke tells us this, that Paul expounded and testified the kingdom of God. Listen. Persuading them concerning Jesus. Both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets. From morning till evening. Acts 28 verse 23. There's a story that never grows old. To those who love the story that never grows old. I can remember hearing preachers a long time ago who believe or not preached a lot longer than I did. I remember the first time I heard Foy Wallace Jr. Because Brother Wallace preached a short sermon when he preached about two and a half hours. And I'm not joking. But I never heard such oratory, not from the standpoint of the choices made by man for all the words that one would learn from man, but just the development of the scriptures. And I've been sitting there an hour and a half or longer before I realized it. And he continued on. We don't have a lot of people today, I fear even in the church, who have the interest in the good word of the living God, the word of reconciliation, to where they'll spend much time at all, even in the privacy of their home, searching the scriptures. Much less to go and listen to somebody preach all day long expounding and testifying of the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, from morning till evening. Let us so desire to have such a love of God and His truth that we would want that regularly and that we would cultivate it. For such truly is a sign of spiritual growth and development. God loved us. Jesus died for us. And the Holy Spirit, through the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, the Word of Reconciliation, Ephesians 6, 17, entreats us, persuading us to come to Jesus. He will save you. Though your sins be a scar, He shall make them white as so. So man's will alone stands in the way of that salvation. I want you to think about that. In the way that we're put together by God. Man's will alone can take all of the moral force God has put into this world to bring man back to God. And it's so strong that he can say no to God's Powerful word, and it won't happen. When God, back in the beginning and the creation of the world, said, Let there be light, light came. But because I am as God created me, if I do not love the truth, if I do not hunger and thirst after righteousness, God can appeal to me and does appeal to me. But if I don't want it, I can say no 
and I will remain in my sins. That's the power of a moral creature in the image of God with free moral agency. I must will to do God's will. And that's the way he wanted it. Because he wants people who love him and who want to serve him to be his. I hope that these things will cause us all to realize that whether it's becoming a Christian or growth as children of God and the family of God, the church, that it's our will that is our greatest enemy. As to our development in anything, most of the time, people come up with views that says, well, make it work without me willing to do what's necessary to make it work. And that's the bane of the world in which we live. Whether it be husbands or fathers, or wives or mothers, or children, or whoever we are. It's awful easy to fall into the devil's snare. That says, yes, that's right intellectually. I agree to that intellectually. But willingly, I'm just not willing to submit to what I know intellectually is the truth. That's a shame. Because God wants us, and he's done all that he can to save a free moral agent. So, what are you willing to do this morning? What are you willing to do this morning? Will you believe with all your heart Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Son of God? Repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and from the heart be obedient completely to the gospel in being immersed in water by the authority of Christ in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission of sins and be ye reconciled to God thereby. The only way you can be. And I imagine to most I need to say, and now why tarryest thou? Rise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. The water doesn't do it. It's obedience to God. It's the blood of Christ shed on Calvary's cross that does it. It's just that he located obedience in the water. Now, if he had said, go out here and cut down one of these trees, the chainsaw, and you'll be saved, would you do it? Well, then how much more so if he says, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins? What's the difference with God's power to save? But you see, it tests my faith and confidence in him and his system. And I must be willing to take him at his word. As a child of God, have you gotten these things? Have you forgotten that you grow and develop in the kingdom just like you did becoming a member of it? It still involves your will. still involves your intellectual processes. It involves your willingness to grow in greater understanding of what it is to be a Christian, one who's of Christ. And if you've sinned, you need to repent of those sins. That's God's second law of pardon. Confess them and pray God for forgiveness. And above all, be ye reconciled to God. If you're subject to the invitation of Jesus Christ, come to Him while we stand and sing.